Now, brothers, I have applied these things to myself and to Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not take pride in one man over against the other. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as, you do, as though you did not? Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7. Dear fellow redeemed, what do you have right now in your life that's not a gift from God? That's what Paul is saying in this verse here, 1 Corinthians 4, 7. He's saying, what do you have right now that you did not receive from the Lord? You see, God is the one that gives. This is a theme throughout all of Scripture. In fact, the apostles were trying to really stress this point at different times to different people. The apostle James wrote, he said, Every good, every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. Everything you have and are is a gift from God, whether you acknowledge it or not. It's so easy for us to get caught up in in kind of, let's just say, living everyday life. So we start kind of looking at ourselves and and the things around us, and we start thinking, well, you know, I did this. See this over here? That was me. Or we start thinking, I earned this. I put the work. I put the time into it. I developed it. Or even worse yet, we might get caught up in the thinking, you know, I'm entitled to, and then fill in the blank to what you think you're entitled to. On so many levels, that's just so wrong. From the very beginning... The scripture calls our attention to the fact that it's God who creates us. It's God who created the world that we live in. It's God that has given us our individual skills, abilities. It's God who puts us in the environments that can harness them or develop them. It's the Lord who moves us to apply the gifts to life. It's God's blanket of grace that he surrounds us with to use gifts. Not just for ourselves, but to use those said gifts and talents for other people and ultimately to the glory of God. So there's something completely and fundamentally wrong with us if we think that anything we have, anything we own, or even ourselves is not a gift from God. To believe anything less than everything that we are and have is a gift from God is is nothing short of being very prideful in ourself. To look at ourselves and say, well, you know, these these blessings, they're mine. I develop them through the use of my time and and my wits. It's become prideful to think that the the blessings and talents we have are are ours. To believe that the the gift blessing then is in and of ourselves is is actually nothing more than, than really a form of plagiarism. You see, we're taking from God and calling it ourselves when it's God himself who gives to us as stewards to use, again, as blessings to the world around us and in his name. I came across a quote about pride that I actually really like. The author said it this way. He said, pride is the sin of trying to be God. It is the sin that proclaims that man can produce out of his own wits and his own judgment and impulses and his own imagination the standards by which he should live. That man is fitted to be his own judge, in fact. So the idea of the quote is that pride is basically saying, you know what, I'm in charge of how I live my life and what I do and how I do it, and no one tells me how to do it different, least of all you, God. Pride really has this kind of effect. It, it works to lift ourselves up, and it pushes other people, and especially God, down. For me to get higher... God has to get lower, along with everyone else. Our first scripture lesson this morning, our attention is taken to Hannah. She, she probably hasn't talked about a whole lot throughout the Bible, but she's a very excellent example of what the opposite of pride is in life. In fact, whereas pride, again, lifts us up, humility intentionally lowers yourself down. Hannah is an example of humility because she realizes something, and you hear it in her prayer that was in our scripture lesson. Hannah looks to God and says, you know, God, you're the one that lifts people up. Not me, not ourselves. It's you, God, in your divine 
wisdom and grace, you lift up and you place low. Here's what she said in 1 Samuel chapter 2, 7 through 8. She said, the Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with the princes and has them inherit the throne of honor. You know what happened here, right? Hannah's singing her, her song of praise, her prayer to the Lord, because the Lord lifted her out of this state of barrenness to the hallowed heights of joy in having a baby. She said it's like this. It's like being low and, and living your life of crawling among the, the ash heap, very descriptive way of not, sounds like not a very flattering way to live. And so being down here in this undesirable situation, it's God who comes and lifts us up. It's God who lifts me up and lifts you up. It's his grace, his mercy, his love that gives us the gifts that exalts us, not me. This morning, Jesus teaches us something then by way of parable. He teaches us about the foolishness of trying to exalt ourselves. For when we do that, we fail. But rather, trust in the Lord. He's the one who exalts us. That in mind, I invite your attention to Luke 14, 1 through 11. On the Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of the prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. Jesus asked the Pharisees and the experts in the law, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him away. Then he asked them, If one of you has a son or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull him out? And they had nothing to say. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you, invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host will invite both of you and will come and say to you, give this man your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to go take a least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So far, these are the very words of our God. The Lord Jesus recorded these words not just for good manner and overall politeness when invited somewhere, but as instruction for us in righteousness, words that work to root out the sin in our lives and put us at the foot of the cross of Christ. We pray then that the Holy Spirit would use these words to impart the blessings that he desires to. To that end, we pray. Sanctify us through your truth, O Lord. Your word is truth. Amen. So to help us understand a little bit more about this whole business of exalting ourselves and, 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 and humbling ourselves, Jesus uses a parable. Before that, though, the context is set like this. Here, at the beginning of, of the chapter, you have a prominent Pharisee invites Jesus to his house for Sabbath day meal. We know this wasn't just a kind move of his heart because we have these two words in here. They invited him over. Why? So they could carefully watch Jesus. Throughout the Gospels, it's pretty clear that these guys are always looking to trip Jesus up, to, to try to find something so they could point to and say, look at Jesus. See, he's not so great. He's doing this. Well, they failed completely, but they tried. Now, Sabbath day meals, they're kind of a big deal at that time. Think of kind of a Sunday afternoon dinner in, in a very formal setting. A setting to which where even where you seat it was kind of important at the meal and the day of. The closest point of comparison probably to the Sabbath day meal that, that in, in our time would probably be the wedding reception where you have the bride and groom centered on the head table there and kind of everyone flowing out from them and everyone sitting and facing them. You've got the bride there and to her side is the maid of honor followed by her bridesmaids. And then on the other side you have the groom, and to his side, the best man, and, and the other fellows, according to that. What you have is Jesus taking in this whole situation, and he's going to use it to teach us something about exalting ourselves and humbling ourselves. And as they are 
positioning themselves, the guests, for the seat of honor, trying to be the best man, basically, to the host. In comes an individual now, a man with an illness, dropsy, as the text tells us. Now, reading this, we might start thinking, well, well that's interesting here. The Pharisee invites Jesus over, and they're kind of all trying to figure out where they're going to sit. And then this guy with illness comes in. Is this a common thing? People with illnesses come to the Pharisee house on the Sabbath day? Probably not. Most biblical commentators and scholars worth anything see this as another trap that the Pharisees were setting to try to catch Jesus. Because what was one of the big things they often accused Jesus of? Working on the Sabbath day. Perfect. Jesus is known for healing. Let's bring in somebody that has an illness and see what Jesus can do about that. This is how insane the blindness of unbelief can lead a person to be. That it would be wrong for Jesus to help somebody on the Sabbath? Well, here we go. Jesus then, seeing the situation, asked the people a question right there. He says, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? They didn't answer. The text goes on. Jesus puts this in front of him. He says, which of you having a son or an ox and it would fall into a well or a pit would not immediately pull him or it out even on the Sabbath? Jesus is saying this because he's saying, which of you sitting here, if you're in a position to lose something, and something valuable, I would hope children are valuable to them, or the ox, which is a financial loss if you lose the ox. Jesus is saying, which of you that has something to lose would not do something to help it or, or gain it or save the son, bring the ox out? After saying that, Jesus healed the man. The text tells us those in attendance remained Silent to the situation. They had nothing to say. Maybe they were just ashamed of themselves for what they were doing. We don't know, but we know they were silent. Jesus then moves on now. After healing, he calls their attention to the scene that unfolded a little bit before this. He called their attention to the fact of how they were kind of jockeying for the place of honor at this feast. You see, the root of the problem here in what Jesus' parable gets to is he's talking about these dangers of pride and how pride can just interrupt and destroy our lives. Pride is, pride is troublesome. Pride always works to take the individual and put yourself at the center of your life. What pride does is it really just shrinks the world around you. It shrinks it down. So then people fade away or they become a means to an end of however or whatever you're trying to accomplish. In fact, can you imagine how much larger our world would be or your particular world if you were smaller in your world? Can you imagine how much larger your world is if Jesus is the center of your world? Pride is a sin. Pride at its core is self-centeredness. It's the root of so many of our problems. Pride shows itself when, when we start thinking that we are entitled to something, that, that we deserve to have a very happy life as far as we define happiness here on earth. And if we don't have that kind of life, then these other people, it's their fault that we're not living the kind of happy, stress-free life that we should be living. Pride says, that's mine. How dare you interrupt with me having it? Yes, pride is sinful. The Bible, Bible clearly shows us that. Sin is simply missing the mark. Missing the mark. What pride does is it misses the mark that God puts in front of us and takes the individual and again puts them in the position that Jesus belongs in, the center of a person's life. We miss the mark then on how God would have us see the world, how God would have us think, how God would have us act. And yes, we spend our time looking down on others for not being as good as us, pushing people away instead of drawing them closer because, well, I'm prideful, I'm better. We should conduct a little pride test here. I don't like doing this because when I do these kind of things, I, I end up failing and being what I don't want to be. The Pharisees, they, they, they serve as wonderful examples of what not to be like. And we use the examples of the Pharisees not so we can look at them and say, well, at least I'm better than the Pharisees, so I'm not so prideful. Not at all. That's being prideful in and of itself. We use the Pharisees because they unfortunately expose a lot of our own nature in our own selves. So here's the little pride test we can use using the Pharisees. The first test, part one, pride. 
pride, it, it drains a person of their empathy. When we are being prideful, we certainly are not showing empathy for anyone else around us. Think of it in the context. The man with dropsy, he seemed more like a piece in a game that the Pharisees were playing of gotcha with Jesus than an individual person that had real problems and needed real help. Pride drains one's ability to feel for someone else. It takes away from the compassion we have for those around us. It results in we can't really cry with other people and their troubles because, you know, it's me and I wouldn't have those kind of troubles because I would figure out an answer to those troubles. Or pride stops us from being happy with other people because they're so easily amused. It takes something else to make someone as sophisticated as me happy about something. So how do you feel about others? Can you laugh with other people? Can you rejoice with them? Can, can, you, can you cry with them? Second test, or second part of our pride test here. Pride is always threatened. Pride is, is always on the defense. It's suspicious of, of everything and anything around it. Think of the Pharisees to Jesus. They were so threatened by Jesus. Why? Why were they so threatened by Jesus? Because they saw Jesus as someone that was going to take away their power, take away their influence, take away their importance, standing with other people. They didn't like this. They didn't like it. But what about you? How do you react to somebody that, that does the same thing that you do? Maybe it's somebody at work. Or maybe it's, it's somebody that, that is married and you see how their relationship is and you have prideful feelings towards that that want well, better. Or maybe it's another parent. How do you feel towards other parents? Do they measure up to your standard that you're, you're giving them? Pride likes to look at others and, of course, evaluate itself as better. And to be honest, pride says, my sins, they look a lot worse on someone else than they do on me. And, of course, it extends really to all areas, doesn't it? Pride is constantly looking evaluating and trying to determine itself better than everyone else around it. It is threatened and on the defense. And the third part about the test, and I find this one the most interesting, pride is really a, a killjoy. Pride just kills the joy in life because you're always protecting yourself. You're always surrounding yourself on the throne of your heart trying to keep it safe, and so you really limit or can't experience the joy in life. It's so busy magnifying everyone else's faults and diminishing or uh, shrinking your own. It's always so busy growing your graces and shrinking everyone else's graces at the same time. And pride struggles at, at finding happiness in life because at the end of the day, you deserve it, don't you? We don't get gifts. We give what we're, or we get what we're entitled to. That's the way pride sees things. So, of course, the Pharisees should have been seating at the seat of honor at the place because they, they deserved it. They deserved it. So Jesus, he tells us this parable so that we can learn. He's saying that you can't lift yourself up in the presence of God. It is a waste of time. Don't do it. Don't try. It's not going to happen. He's saying, in fact, when we try to lift ourselves up in the presence of God, we only lower ourselves and hurt ourselves. It's our pride that pushes us to say, God, look at me. I deserve this. Verse 10, Christ says this, but when you are invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. We can easily say this, that the antithesis of pride is humility. I've always enjoyed this quote by C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity. He kind of defines humility as this. He says, humility is this art of self-forgetfulness. It's the quality of forgetting who you are in Christ. So you don't worry about what you're owed. You don't worry about what you deserve. Rather, you completely trust God's ability to take care of you. See to your needs. See to your loved ones. So how does self-forgetfulness in Christ look? Can we find a picture of that? Certainly we can. It's a good question. Here's the illustration we can use. Look to Jesus. Jesus is true God, possessing all power in heaven and on earth, yet he humbled himself to be born in a barn instead of a palace. 
Jesus could have enjoyed everything that creation would offer, yet the scripture tells us he had nowhere to lay his head. Jesus could have come down from the cross on Good Friday and taught a lesson to those that taunted him and mocked him, but he remained on the cross, humbling himself, staying faithful to the Father's will. He accepted and embraced the indignity of death so that he could lay down his life so we could pick it up. So we could pick it up. So what about us? What's Jesus teaching us about how to be humble and not exalt ourselves? He's telling us the world doesn't revolve around us. It revolves around him. Let him be the focus. Remember, pride again, it's lifting yourself up. Humility is is placing yourself low. Here's the overarching point then that Jesus is making. It's impossible to exalt yourself in the presence of God. You can't look to God and make a case of why you deserve salvation. God discerns the heart. He knows all things. It doesn't work to come to God and say, but God, I did this. I can do this. I'm worth this much. God says, be perfect for your Father in heaven is perfect. It can't be done. Christ is bringing us low with the law and saying in and of ourselves, stay low. Yet, the Lord comes to us and says, I exalt you. I will lift you up. So where do we go from here? Well, for starters, we, we examine where, where are we prideful in our lives? Where is it that we've got to come back to Christ-centered reality, push ourselves to the side, and look to Christ? Is the Lord telling us that we shouldn't try to develop our gifts and talents to the best we can? Not at all. For when you develop your gifts and talents in the Lord, you're using them to God's glory and his grace. His grace. When you do well, you're blessed by God. When your accomplishments and your accolades gather up, you're blessed by God. And when you fall short, and yes, when you fail, you also are being blessed by God, just probably not in the way you thought you would be. I came across another interesting quote about pride. The quote said this, A humble Christian is suspicious of nothing in the world as much as he is suspicious of his own heart. So let the gospel energize you. Let it pick you up and put Christ at the center. Look at the gifts and the blessings that God has given you and how he exalts you in your daily life and how the Lord uses them through you. And of course we fall short. We don't do everything we want to do. But let the limitations on your abilities of accomplishing everything you want to do remind you that you're not a superman and the whole world doesn't revolve around you and everything you have to do. Instead, let them remind you of the grace that God has for you. Let them bring you back to reality, centered in Christ. When you snap at your spouse because you're tired, when you sink into a little bit of depression because your to-do list is towering over you at the end of the day, when your body hurts, when your mind aches, the limitations remind you that you can't do everything and tomorrow doesn't look any better, let these things bring you back to the foot of Christ. You're not going to do it all by yourself but through Christ you can do all things. Then, then you're ready for the subtle truth that the Lord gives in this parable. That you can't impress God with a list of wonderfulness and you don't want to do that. Rather, you're broken, you're exposed through the law, and Jesus comes to you and he says, let me lift you up. Let me bring you to the table and set you at the seat of honor. Jesus says to us, your failures, they're not my failures. I'm going to take them. I took on your flesh. I know what you're going through, and I'm going to lift you up. When you failed to do things perfectly as God demands, I didn't. Trust that. Let me exalt you in that. From the cross was the great exchange. Christ's life for our life. God's love for ours. So when we look at the question, and and we look at our lives and see the many gifts, yes, by the grace of God, everything we have is a gift from God, and the Lord, the giver of good gifts, continues to keep giving such wonderful gifts to us. In his name we pray. Amen.